Uh, I spoke earlier today, so I don't know if you heard my earlier talk, so I'll repeat some of that, but some of it will also be new material. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> this drug that Dan was just talking about that uh, we're developing in a number of diseases, but all the diseases are characterized by uh, <clears throat> right here, this angiogenesis, which is the growth of new blood vessels. Uh, in some diseases, it's very obvious, like heart disease. You have uh, inhibition of coronary artery growth. We've put our drug into the hearts of patients with coronary artery disease, and I'll show you some clinical trial data on that. But more recently, these uh, other diseases, such as Parkinson's disease, uh, where researchers have shown that a lack of blood flow in the brains of these patients is initiating uh, this disease. And I'll show you some data on that. We have some very nice data in animal models of Parkinson's. So what is angiogenesis? Here's natural angiogenesis. Use it all the time. Cut yourself. Uh, angiogenesis is simply, these are new blood vessels formed in injured tissues. <clears throat> This is a wound, so it's involved in wound healing. But this very same process can grow new blood vessels in the heart uh, and also in the brain, as I'll show you, okay? This is something you use every day. What you don't use every day is something which we call therapeutic angiogenesis. This is where we're driving angiogenesis with a drug, <clears throat> which I'll talk about in a second. So this is uh, giving tissues that need a boost in their blood supply by having them grow more blood vessels. And for example, I'll show you in the heart, in a diseased heart, someone with severe coronary artery disease, you might have a situation looking like this. We inject the drug directly into the heart muscle, and I'll show you pictures, angiograms, where we can grow blood vessels uh, in about three months' time. And these patients do a lot better uh, on the treadmill and other testing. So angiogenesis is important in a number of diseases. Insufficient angiogenesis, stroke, heart disease, these account for over 50% of deaths in the world. Uh, excess of angiogenesis, too much blood vessel growth is very important in cancer. So tumors are rapidly dividing. Uh, they need a lot of blood supply. And in fact, there are drugs on the market that attack excessive angiogenesis and are effective in, in uh, <clears throat> curtailing cancer. Okay, so what I'll talk about today are some of the clinical trials we've done in uh, the lower extremities, uh, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, peripheral artery disease. I'll show you clinical trial data from the heart uh, where we injected the growth factor directly into the heart. And I have a little ABC News clip on that that they did. And I'll end up with some of our newer brain indications where we think uh, growing blood vessels in specific areas of the brain could uh, <clears throat> attack such things as uh, Alzheimer's, stroke, and Parkinson's disease. All right, let me tell you a little bit about the drug. The drug is a natural growth factor. So it's a protein. It's found in our bodies. Uh, we use it all the time naturally, as I mentioned. Uh, we can take the gene for this growth factor and put it into bacteria and grow up unlimited quantities. So this is how all pharmaceutical companies make protein drugs, insulin, growth hormone. You get bacteria to grow up unlimited quantities and you just purify it from that. And this is done in facilities. This is a manufacturing facility where it would be vats of FGF1 producing bacteria in here and uh, it's a pretty simple process to get the drug. <clears throat> Okay, so let me show you some data in the heart. Uh, so in the heart, we inject uh, the growth factor directly into the heart muscle. This is important. If you put it in the bloodstream, it just gets washed away. Um, so with a catheter, we can go up through the legs, through the femoral artery, and come in right through the aorta here, and actually inject inside the heart uh, with a catheter. So after about 12 weeks, let me just show you one uh, video clip. This is a trial, phase two trial that I supervised uh, where we injected this. This wasn't with the catheter. The first time we did it was we actually opened up their chest and it directly into the heart from outside of the chest wall. But uh, these patients did very well. Uh, these are 
a clip, they went to our Cincinnati clinical trial site and interviewed some of the patients there and the physician who was doing the trial. So let me. Arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually There's capable of growing brand new arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing is so blood new vessels blood right vessels there. growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. Okay, so that woman, that Constance Donnelly that you saw, she was uh, probably responded the best out of anyone in that trial. She was probably the sickest, uh, and she was in the low dosing group. She got the lowest, we had three dosing groups in that trial, and she got the lowest dose, but her heart was primed to respond to our drug. <clears throat> and again, if we had injected it into nor normal parts of her heart, it wouldn't have done anything. Only in the ischemic part do you see that blood vessel formation as the cardiologist showed in that video clip. Okay, let's move on to the brain. Uh, the brain is an incredibly vascularized organ, probably the most vascularized organ in our body. Uh, billions of neurons in our brain uh, need nourishment, uh, need oxygen, and importantly, they need to have... Oh, okay. Anytime. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, you get these beta amyloid plaques that can accumulate in the brains. We think uh, lack of blood perfusion results in those not being taken away from the brain, and I'll show you some data in that regard. So, vascular disorder in the brain, uh, it's a suspect in all of these neurodegenerative diseases. And this is not work we've done, but work done by labs around the world. I'm going to show you some data on Parkinson's disease. We have a clinical trial plan for Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, uh, MS. Alzheimer's is very interesting. Uh, I'll talk about that, where studies actually at McGill in Canada, in Montreal, showed that the very first symptom that appears in Alzheimer's before cognitive decline is a lack of blood perfusion in the brain. Uh, stroke, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder important for the military. MSA is kind of a speeded up form of Parkinson's, a very, uh, very deadly disease, chronic depression, dementia, and this is what the NFL football players have come down with, this chronic encephalopathy, which again is thought to have a vascular etiology. Okay, one concept I want to discuss just briefly is the neurovascular unit. This is where the blood supply in the brain interacts with the neurons. So I showed you the brain being very vascularized with arteries, uh, smaller arterioles, and then the real business part of where the work is going on is actually at the small capillary level. These are the smallest blood vessels in the brain and in our body. <clears throat> Here's a capillary supplying uh, nutrients to a neuron. So every neuron in your brain basically has a dedicated capillary. And you can imagine if this gets clogged or gets damaged or it's destroyed, uh, these neurons are not going to do as well. So in Parkinson's disease, for example, we feel that these vessels get clogged in a very small part of the brain, the part of the brain which uh, is affected in Parkinson's. And I'll show you some data where we can regenerate uh, those neurons with our drug uh, in animal models of Parkinson's. Another thing the drug... Uh, stimulates by increasing blood flow in the brain is uh, stem cells. 
Uh, your stem cells need adequate blood perfusion to divide and mature. Uh, I'll show you a video clip at the end where we all have these stem cells in our brains. We have less of them. They're less active as we get older. But blood perfusion causes these to differentiate into neurons. And so in Parkinson's disease, we feel that what our drug is doing, by increasing blood flow, we're getting more dopamine-producing neurons in these patients and reversing the symptoms of, those disease, of that disease. <clears throat> Okay, let me talk about some work we've done in chronic stroke. We don't have human data here, but we have some animal data. Uh, as you know, a stroke results from a clot in an artery leading into the brain, or actually an artery that's already in the brain, and you get lack of blood flow causing this uh, stroke volume, uh, dead neurons, and then this area at risk, it's called the penumbra, and by increasing blood flow to that area, we can save this, these cells that are at risk in the penumbra. On it. Now in animals, we can do the same thing. We can cause a stroke in animals, and this is what it looks like. Uh, it's tough being a, rabbit, a laboratory rat. It's, you don't want to be a lab rat coming back. You get things sliced and diced, but here is a rat brain. Uh, sliced up. This is in a rat that's been given a stroke. Here's a damaged area. And then if you treat that animal for two to three weeks with our drug, FGF1, you can see uh, the stroke volume is down. Uh, and there's repopulation of this area with both blood vessels, as I'll show you next, and with new neurons. These animals do much better on their uh, testing, their motor skill testing. Let's look in this area of damage in these animals. Uh, this, these are capillaries now. We're just looking at the blood supply, but you know, neurons would be in this area as well. Here's a normal rat brain, nice capillaries, and then we give them a stroke. You see you decimate the blood vessels uh, very soon after the stroke. And then if we treat those animals in the middle panel here with our drug, FGF1, you can see uh, regeneration of blood vessels, not quite back to normal, but certainly much better than here. And in the untreated animals, you see this, this uh, tangled, disordered vasculature, okay? These animals are not doing nearly as well as these animals. A traumatic brain injury. This is an injury that often results from uh, shaking, violent shaking of the head, which uh, would occur in a automobile accident or other form of, uh, <clears throat> of kind of very traumatic uh, injury. And again, in animal models, we can give an animal a traumatic brain injury. This is a normal uh, mouse brain. If you give it a traumatic injury here, you can see 24 hours after the insult, you get this area of uh, damaged brain tissue. These animals have lots of deficits. Uh, treating for three weeks with our drug, FGF, you can see this is healed, this lesion is healed. So again, this is a clinical trial that we will uh, test in humans with, with data like this. Let me talk about uh, neurodegenerative diseases. These include such diseases as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, we know in Alzheimer's, uh, the brain shrinks incredibly. There's loss of uh, neurons, blood vessels, and other structural tissue. Uh, we also know that in Alzheimer's, we get these tangles of toxic proteins. They're called plaques. So not only is there less blood flow in this brain of these Alzheimer's patients, but they also accumulate these toxic proteins, which are toxic uh, to the neurons. So let me tell you about, yeah, I'm sorry. Right, no, it's a good question. Right, so these, these tangles are actually a normal protein that is in the neuron uh, and has a function. But for some reason that's not known, it gets misfolded and it aggregates 
uh, into these what are called plaques. And these, these are toxic to the neurons. For 15 years, pharmaceutical companies have tried to develop drugs to disrupt this, antibodies, chemicals. And every trial has failed. So there's been no new drug for Alzheimer's in probably 20 years. Well, we're trying. We're going to try our growth factor, but it's a... Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a good disease. It's a tough one, but, you know, I think, let me show you here. Uh, this was done here uh, in Montreal in Canada uh, where they filed over 1,000 patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, mainly imaging, but they did cognitive studies as well. So they looked at the beta amyloid, uh, they looked at blood flow, which we really are interested in, and they looked at other uh, properties in the brain. Uh, so, and they followed some of these patients for many years, 10 to 20 years, and what they found, this is again by McGill, they looked at, this is early Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, uh, this is late onset Alzheimer's, and these are abnormalities in the patients, okay? So here's normal, and then the disease progresses, they get all these abnormalities. The very first abnormality that comes up in Alzheimer's is this guy right here, and that's vascular, okay? So these guys have less blood flow in their brains. Uh, this symptom precedes cognitive decline or the beta amyloid uh, accumulation. So it's the very first symptom that appears in Alzheimer's. So we're going to do a trial where we're going to treat patients early on with this drug which we think can restore blood perfusion to, to the brain. And in the, and I'll show you some data where we think it also can remove these toxic proteins that accumulate in the brains of people with different neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, let me talk about Parkinson's disease. Unlike Alzheimer's, this disease only affects a very small portion of the brain. Uh, this is called the substantia nigra. This is, nigra means dark or black. These are black uh, dopamine producing neurons. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter which you need for proper movement in your brain. It's known in Parkinson's that these begin to die off, uh, secrete less dopamine, and lead to the characteristic uh, tremors and movement disorders, disorders seen in Parkinson's. What's going on in Parkinson's? Well, no one really knows, but what is being appreciated, not by us, but by other groups, is that there's a lack of blood perfusion in this region. And you can look at blood perfusion with very sensitive and accurate uh, MRI technology. It's called functional MRI, where you can look at blood flow in uh, different regions of the brain. So let's, if you look at blood flow just in this tiny area that's affected in Parkinson's, uh, this is blood perfusion in healthy adults and subjects with Parkinson's. Here's a healthy 21-year-old in that area, 100% maximal blood flow. A uh, healthy 65-year-old, again, less blood flow in that area, but not giving the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease patients have almost half the amount of blood perfusion in that area where the dopamine producing cells are. So we think this is leading to the death and dysfunction of the dopamine cells in, those, uh, in this uh, disease population. Uh, Parkinson's patients also can have other problems. They can have problems with cognition. And again, using the same functional MRI, you can look at blood flow in other parts of the brain which are involved in cognition, memory, and you can see here, this is uh, blue is normal blood flow, yellow is decreased, red is severely decreased blood flow. So this patient with Parkinson's and dementia is having blood flow problems in a number of areas of their brain. And we would think our drug, if it's effective, could also affect blood flow in these areas as well. Okay, let me show you some animal data in Parkinson's disease. You can give both, come on in. You can give both rats and monkeys Parkinson's. So I'll show you some rat data, but the monkey data is very compelling in my mind. Uh, 
So you can give animals a specific toxin, which will take out their dopamine-producing cells, and they will come down with the classical tremors and motor dysfunction seen in uh, the disease in humans. Uh, so with rats, uh, so this is their motor skill score, motor testing. Uh, so normal animal, animal with Parkinson's, a significant decrease in motor skills. And then with our drug, an increase in motor skills, not quite back to normal, but about twice what you see in the Parkinson's animals. Importantly, though, this is the important concept, is that if you look in the brains of those rats, you can see that we're regenerating the dopamine cells. They stain brown in that very tiny region. So no treatment, treatment with the drug. We're reestablishing dopamine cells in the brain there, which is a, what's known as a disease-modifying effect. We're regrowing these dopamine uh, cells in the brain. Now, the gold standard for testing Parkinson's disease drug is in a monkey model of Parkinson's, where you can give that same toxin to the monkey, and it kills off their dopamine-producing cells. And this is a much longer experiment. See, this is over months. But if you give that toxin to the monkeys over a period of about nine months, they come down again with all the classical motor symptoms of Parkinson's, tremors, uh, shaking, if we treat those animals with our drug or with a placebo dose, at the end of about eight months, there's a significant difference in the motor skills of these animals, okay? Uh, and if we look inside the brains of these monkeys, again, we can see what we think is a disease-modifying event occurring. We're regenerating these dopamine-producing cells in the brains of these animals versus untreated animals. <clears throat> Also importantly, I mentioned toxic proteins that accumulate in these diseases. In Alzheimer's, it's the beta amyloid plaque. Well, in Parkinson's, it's a different protein. It's called synuclein. But it is there. Here it is in the animal's brain. You can see this tangled jumble of proteins. This is toxic to neurons. When we treat those animals with FGF1, not only do we improve their motor skills, but you can see we reduce the amount of this toxic aggregated protein in the brains of these animals. Okay, not quite back to this, but cer certainly better. So we feel here that by reestablishing blood flow to these uh, animals, we're not only generating those dopamine neurons to be produced, the new dopamine neurons, but also flushing away these toxic uh, proteins. So we've submitted all this to our FDA in the United States, and. Uh, we'll be starting a clinical trial. We have one that's actually going to be going on in Mexico, probably before the one in the U.S. gets going. But we'll be in two countries, and each country will, well, in Mexico will be one site, but in the U.S. we'll have up to five sites for the clinical trial, studying three increasing doses of the drug of FGF1. Uh, there will be no placebo group. All the patients will get a daily intravenous injections. So we'll do a one-hour infusion into the patient's watch them for an hour, and then they can go home. Uh, but they still have to hang around the clinic for six weeks. So it is a commitment for the patients and their families. <clears throat> uh, safety and effectiveness will be monitored, and we'll follow the patients for up to a year. Yeah, so intracranial, uh, there have been trials with that, um, you got to drill, drill through the brain, and infection's a real problem with that. Uh, they stopped the trial in Europe with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, because. That's correct, that's correct. So, uh, but the same thing would happen if you put it directly into the brain. They, the, the, those studies, they, they don't put it right into the area. It still can get flushed out by the spinal fluid that kind of circulates. but. For here, no, we, we decided to do IV. We're going to use an indwelling catheter, so it's going to be in the person for the entire trial because we give drug every day, so you don't want to be sticking someone every day, and we'll be taking blood out for, for testing. Uh, and <clears throat> they'll be, uh, you know, we'll watch them for about an hour, but they will we'll only be in the clinic for about two hours, so they don't have to hang around all day. And But they will... You know, like if we do a trial in Las Vegas where our company is based, they will have to be in Las Vegas for six weeks, which is not a bad place to be for six weeks. Uh, 
Anyway, I mentioned these other diseases that uh, other researchers, and we have a phase one trial which we've submitted for Luke Eric's disease in Mexico. Uh, that'll go into the US uh, probably later <clears throat> after the first of the year. But all these diseases, we can do the same basic clinical trial. Give them the drug for six weeks and see how they do. Uh, and if we don't see anything, then we increase the dose or we increase the duration of how long we treat the, the patient. So there's, this is drug development. You've got a trial and error type of thing. Uh, we have not seen any side effects in humans, uh, but for our FDA submission, we had to do much, much higher doses in animals. So at 100-fold higher doses than we're using in these clinical trials, we see blood vessels growing in the eye, which is not good. That can lead to blindness uh, and vessels in the kidney, but mainly blood vessel growth where it shouldn't be happening. It, it could. So yeah, we screen very carefully all our patients for cancer. If they have cancer, you can't be in the trial because it, it would stimulate. This, this drug does not cause cancer, but it would sti it could stimulate its growth, exactly. Okay, finally, I'm going to leave you with some work that we didn't do, but which points to how blood perfusion in the brain affects all of us as we age. I showed you, uh, let me just show you this. These are healthy 65-year-olds have less blood perfusion than a 21-year-old, uh, and then with Parkinson's. But So as we get older, all of us, uh, our blood perfusion in our brain decreases, and Columbia University Medical Center did a study on this, why our brains perform worse as we get older, why we forget, become more forgetful, forget names and keys. And it, it's very interesting. Uh, Time Health did a video on it because it, it had widespread interest. And uh, it kind of goes along with, we're saying that blood perfusion is involved in uh, brain health. So let me show you this video. This is out of Columbia University uh, Medical Center in New York, why our brains perform worse as we age. So they, the researchers looked at 28 healthy people who had died suddenly of accidents. Uh, and they ranged in age from 14 years to 79 years of age. Uh, they looked at the number of brain cells. They were mainly looking at stem cells in different parts of the brain, mainly memory. They were looking at memory function. Uh, they found that older people made as many new neurons as younger ones do. What is different in the aging brain is a reduced blood flow to nourish these cells. And this is exactly what we're saying. With the diseases, less blood flow. They're saying in aging, as we get older, we have less blood flow. Uh, so in older people, uh, the cells are dividing less, generating fewer new neurons than in younger people. So older people have the pool of cells there. They're just not as active. They're not dividing not as active as the younger ones. So the researchers at Columbia said it may be possible to combat age-related cognitive decline if we're able to improve blood flow to the brain. And we could not agree more. This is what we're trying to do with these diseases. But you know, who knows? Maybe someone in the future will, will do an aging trial to see if it works in cognitive decline and aging. So. Uh, we have a booth here. Uh, if you want more information on the drug, we also, the company is going public, so there's uh, investment opportunity as well and uh, an IPO, and there's also pre-IPO uh, placements that are going on around this technology. But um, I'm the science guy. I spend all the money, but the business guy at the uh, booth who's raising the money can tell you more about that. So that's the end. Any questions? Sure. Yeah, no, we'll do, uh, so in the first trials, we just do them in the States, but then the next phase two, we'll spread that around to Europe and Canada. So you go to our website and we list all the trials that we're doing. And if you or a loved one has Parkinson's, you can sign off for the Parkinson's trial. We send you information on what, so the FDA has, or even in Canada, has all these criteria that you have to meet to be in a trial. You know, you can't have cancer. Uh, 
you have to have Parkinson's disease. Uh, you can't be pregnant if you're being treated with our drug. So, so if you, you meet those criteria, then you get screened by the neurologist. I'm not running the, the neurologist who runs the trial will screen the patients, and if they qualify, they'll be enrolled. Yeah. Okay. No, so the, the angiogram shows. Right. Right. So these are patients that can't have a bypass or a stent. Okay. So they might have microvascular disease, or some people who have bypasses can't have a second one for whatever reason. So they come in, they have an angiogram, and you can see that they have lack, lack of blood flow, ischemia. So we put our drug in a catheter, an injection catheter, and come up through the femoral artery. We go right inside the heart, into the beating heart, and yeah, you know, we're in the heart. In the, so we're injecting this right into the wall of the heart, maybe 20 places, and that stimulates. We are. Uh, it's very well, it's a Johnson & Johnson catheter. It goes in only a very small amount, yep, but you know, you have worry about it going through the heart, but it doesn't. And you inject right into the heart muscle wall. The drug stays there for about a week, and it simulates this whole new blood vessel growth. It's a schema, yeah, dead muscle or healthy muscle. So if you do it, healthy muscle is not going to, so it's got to be this ischemic tissue which responds really well to the growth factor. Yeah. It's just, it's a protein, so you have proteins in your bodies made natural, hormones, growth hormone, insulin, so it's a very potent protein. It's, it's not, so we know it's structure from humans and we just synthesize the DNA for it and put it into uh, bacteria basically. So bacteria make unlimited quantities of this growth factor. This is how all the larger companies and smaller ones make these biotechnology products. They're all made in bacteria or yeast or these lower things where you can grow up in limited quantities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, we don't have the patent, so the patent's gone. So, so what we have is market exclusivity. So if we bring this to market first for the heart, no one else can use it for the heart. Ten years, yeah, so that's, that's our protection. Well, it's a race. If someone else gets there before us, they win, so. No, <laughs> no, we don't, we don't. <laughs> For the approved drug, yeah, once it's approved, yeah. So for the heart, it's a one-time injection, so that would probably be like around $5,000 for the drug and the catheter, and, but that uh, we think would last three to five years or longer. Uh, for these, we really haven't thought about the, neuro, the brain indications. That's much more drug is being used there. It's every day for six weeks. Uh, and it might, those trials might have to be done for longer periods of time. So, you know, I, I spend money. I don't, <laughs> what's that? 3.8 million. 3.8 million. <laughs> yeah, some of these new drugs are incredibly expensive. The cancer drugs or even these drugs that aren't really treating the base. So, you know, I, I don't know what the cost of the drug will be, but uh, hopefully as a scientist, I would hope that it's affordable and not out of reach of people who need it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yep.